Section 20 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 6, Part 4. Spheres of Action, Solicitation there were other intricate questions arising from human perversity acuna tells us that the more probable opinion affirms the guilt of a confessor who acts as a pimp with his penitent for the benefit of another and also in the more frequent case in which he solicits the penitent to serve as procurist for him with her daughter or a friend de Sousa, however draws a distinction and asserts positively that in the former case he is liable under the papal briefs and in the latter he is not nor is he if he tries to seduce a woman who is confessing to another priest then there was a nice question as to priests without faculties to hear confessions or who were under suspension or excommunication on which the doctors were evenly divided distantly akin to this were cases in which laymen would secrete themselves in confessionals and listen to confessions whether from prurient motives or through jealousy or to obtain opportunities for seduction if they carried deceit to the point of conferring absolution they incurred serious penalties as we shall see hereafter if they merely solicited the penitent the weight of authority is that there is no sacrament and no liability to the papal briefs there was another phase of the subject on which the doctors were hopelessly divided what was known as passive solicitation where the woman was the tempter this case we are told was rare and we can readily believe it although there are not wanting zealous defenders of the cloth who assert that in the majority of cases the penitent is really the guilty party the earliest allusion to the matter is by paramo in fifteen ninety eight whose treatment of it shows that as yet there had been no formal decision if the confessor resists he says he should denounce the woman if he yields he should denounce both her and himself though perhaps it would be best to consult the pope as regards the confessor the authorities differ irreconcilably but they are virtually unanimous in holding that as the woman is not mentioned in the papal briefs she is not subject to the inquisition yet notwithstanding the absence of papal authority we happen to find maria izquierda prosecuted for this offence in seventeen fifteen by the valencia tribunal and in seventeen seventy two antonia coquis wife of bruno vidal by that of madrid it will be seen that solicitation subject to inquisitorial action was so purely technical an offence and one so difficult of precise definition that it offered many doubtful points affording ample opportunity of evasion by the adroit gregory the fifteenth had sought to be precise and explicit but the ingenuity of casuists and evildoers continued to find exceptions and in sixteen sixty one the roman inquisition rendered sixteen decisions on disputed points but its ingenuity was baffled by so intricate a subject and it was obliged to leave some matters rather darkened than illuminated then it was pointed out that the papal briefs were silent as to handing love letters to penitents during confession and as everything not specifically prohibited was held to be licit this was assumed to be allowable until alexander the seventh stamped the proposition as erroneous after this the perverted ingenuity of the casuists had free scope until in seventeen forty one benedict the fourteenth in the solemn bull sacramentum penitentia deplored that human wickedness was perverting to the destruction of souls that which god had instituted for their salvation he renewed and confirmed the brief of gregory the fifteenth and added to its definitions all attempts in the confessional to lead penitents astray by signs nods touching indecent words and writings 
whether to be read there or subsequently in eloquent words he warned all those in authority to see that the wandering sheep endeavouring to re-enter the fold should not be abandoned to the cruel beasts seeking their destruction and he branded the sacrilegious seducers as ministers of satan rather than of christ still it was only the technical heresy and not morality that was considered and illicit relations between spiritual father and daughter outside of the confessional were left unpunished as before at the same time he endeavoured to suppress the most flagrant abuse connected with solicitation an abuse which more than anything else smoothed the path for the seducer the absolution of the woman by her partner in guilt alexander the seventh in sixteen sixty five had only gone so far as to condemn the proposition that this absolution relieved her from the obligation of denouncing her seducer a proposition which proves how audacious were the laxer moralists of the period who asserted it benedict now formally prohibited the guilty confessor from hearing the confession of his accomplice except on the deathbed when no other confessor could be had he deprived him of the power of granting absolution which consequently was invalid and the attempt to do so imposed ipso facto excommunication strictly reserved to the holy see as this excommunication suspended all the functions of the priest until removal its observance would have gone far to check any abuse that was not incurable but neither priest nor penitent paid to it the slightest attention it is impossible to trace in the business of the spanish inquisition any result from benedict's well-meant legislation trials for solicitation continued as numerous as ever and the only difference observable is that in the second half of the eighteenth century the sentences almost invariably assume that the culprit has incurred excommunication for absolving his accomplice that until he obtains absolution from this he must abstain from using his functions that he must consult his conscience as to his ministrations hitherto while under this irregularity and that his penitents must be discreetly warned to repeat their confessions which having been made to him were invalid this continued to the end and is a feature in the case of fray joseph montero the last one sentenced by the cordova tribunal april twenty four eighteen nineteen it is no wonder that confessors endeavoured to evade the technical definitions of the papal briefs for if they could do so no matter how heinous was their guilt there was practically no penalty juan sanchez asserts that a priest who has commerce with his penitent is not obliged to specify the fact when making confession for it is not incest and there is no papal prohibition of it all authorities from that time to this tell us that he can obtain absolution from any confessor for it is not a reserved case which shows the universal benignity of the bishops and the popes who have the power of reserving to themselves the absolution of what sins they please it is easy to understand therefore how in the trials the inquisitors bent their energies to obtain definite evidence as to the exact location and time of the acts of solicitation and how the accused sought to prove not his innocence but his dexterity in evading the definitions of the papal decrees a suggestive example is the case of dr pedro mendizabal cura of the parish of santa ana in the city of mexico he was denounced june twenty one eighteen o nine by doña maria guadalupe rezero by command of her confessor when she stated that in january eighteen o seven she made to him a general confession too long to be finished in one day on returning to his church to complete it she was told to go up to his room when he said he was too busy to listen to her she retired but on her way downstairs his servant recalled her and on entering his apartment he threw his arms around her professed ardent love and promised to support her if she would become his mistress which she refused 
as he had thus eluded the definitions of benedict the fourteenth four calificadores out of six reported that he was not technically guilty of solicitation the denunciation was filed away and in eighteen seventeen there came another of which he had warning in order that he might spontaneously accuse himself as he did it was from an attractive young girl of seventeen and investigation developed four more cases of girls of whom he was confessor abundant evidence showed habitual indecent liberties hugging kissing sitting in his lap in presence of their families or even in public resorts he had been ordered out of two houses and on appeal to the archbishop he had been forbidden to confess one of the girls who was a boarder in a convent the distraction of the mother of the first accuser endeavoring to save her daughter from one whose authority as a priest overawed her is very touching and suggestive yet in all this there was no proof of anything in the act of confession as one of the calificadores piously remarked god in his goodness preserved him from this two calificadores argued at much length that he was not guilty of solicitation then two others proved that he was guilty and finally two more laboriously demonstrated that the first pair were correct this is the last document in the case it is dated november three eighteen nineteen and as the inquisition was suppressed in june eighteen twenty and as there is no endorsement on the record showing that the case was concluded mendizibal undoubtedly escaped to continue his corrupting career especially as he had four out of six calificadores in his favor the technical teas which eliminated morality from consideration resulted in curious contrasts in november seventeen sixty two fray clemente de cartagena went to toledo to assist in the profession of his niece geronima in the bernardine convent where he already had a sister he and his sister were in the confessional near the altar when some duty called her away and she told geronima to go to her uncle she seated herself in the confessional while he occupied the penitent's place outside and in an affectionate talk he asked her to kiss him the next day he said to her that he had forgotten at the moment that they were in the confessional this made no impression on her until she heard the nuns talking about the exceeding delicacy of such matters and she consulted fray fernando de san josef who ordered her to denounce her uncle this she did in writing and fray fernando conveyed it to the tribunal which duly took up the case we shall see that prosecutions required two distinct and separate denunciations inquiries according to custom were made of all the other tribunals fortunately for fray clemente nothing was found against him and the case was suspended but if there had been or if subsequently he chanced to draw upon himself a denunciation the innocent kiss to his niece would count as though he had deliberately seduced a penitent it was the spot and not the nature of the act that was decisive against this may be set the case of cristobal chimeno parish priest of manzanera a brute who was in the habit of violating the young girls of his church who came to his house for examination in the doctrina cristiana as a preparation for communion at marriage until mothers would not trust their daughters there alone they were his penitents but the outrage was not in the confessional and he had nothing to fear under the papal decrees at length however he made himself liable to the inquisition by pretending to confess pasquala torres at her marriage without absolving her and then when administering communion to her and her bridegroom dropping the host into the ciborium a sacrilege for which he was duly punished by the valencia tribunal so complete indeed is the dissociation of morals and solicitation that some doctors hold that when a priest is confessing a sick woman if she falls into delirium or stupor he can violate her without exposing himself to denunciation it is satisfactory however to be told that the weight of authority is opposed to this opinion End of section 20. Recording by Linda Johnson.